for tuning in today. All right. So last time I gave grand rounds, I didn't have any disclosures. Now I have a few. Uh, they actually don't pertain at all to this talk, but uh, just for full disclosure. Um, some other things to think about. So I am an employee of the University of Washington. And as Colin mentioned, I'm a physician. And I practice medicine by developing laboratory-developed tests. And as part of the work I've done, I've also uh, acquired quite a few volunteer positions. So I've done quite a bit of volunteer work with the College of American Pathologists and the Association for Molecular Pathology. And I've also been uh, asked to work with the DAIA on their scientific advisory board. So also some disclaimers. So I am not a lawyer, although I'm going to be talking a lot about legal things. And so really, my analysis today is based on my experience. So my interpretation of the guidelines, discussions with you know, national experts in this area, discussions with congressional staff, FDA staff, CMS staff, et cetera, and all kinds of different communications that uh, have happened over the last five or six years. So at the end of this talk, I really want to be able to have you describe some of the sentinel events in the history of medical regulation. Uh, identify some of the aspects that are relevant to laboratory developed tests and in, in our practice of medicine. And then you'll really be able to enumerate some of the key provisions that are in the legislation that's been introduced so far to date. So I'm going to give some historical background, uh, give some you know, uh, insight into how things got to be the way they are. And then I'm going to talk about some of the, the legislative proposals that are in uh, the process right now. I'm going to focus on three in particular. Uh, but We'll touch on some others as well, and then you know, summarize all this and, and talk about where things are going. So one of the questions that, that comes up often is, is how did we actually get the FDA? And so a lot of this can really be traced back to over 100 years ago when we start looking at, at things that were happening in society. And so I think a lot of people in high school may have read The Jungle by uh, Upton Sinclair. And you know, this particular work was, was really designed to be an, a piece of investigative journalism, if you will, with a, a fictional bent. And it was really trying to you know, focus on the immigrant population in uh, Chicago and their, their mistreatment at the time. But what got people's attention was, was the really gruesome dis discussion of the meatpacking industry in Chicago at the time. And so you know, this uh, portrayal was so shocking to so many people that it actually led to a congressional investigation. And so this led to something called the Neil Re Reynolds Report, and this was submitted to Congress back in uh, 1906. And because of public pressure at the time, this actually resulted in uh, the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. So the Pure Food and Drug Act is, is a predecessor to the uh, development of the FDA. And it was actually in the Department of Agriculture at the time. It was in the Bureau of Chemistry within our government. Um, and you did a bunch of different things. But one of them was to ban foreign and interstate traffic in adulterated or mislabeled foods and drug products. And you know, part of this act actually established you know, what was considered adulterated, what was considered misbranding. And these are terms that if you, you talk to anybody in the FDA, they throw around commonly and, and talk about all the time. Um, from the drug aspect, things that were important is it actually required that the active ingredient be included on the label, and then also that there be some minimum purity of that drug uh, in that, that container. And a lot of this was actually influenced by patent medicines. So, you know, these medicines that people would cook up and then sell with these outrageous claims. And, you know, here's a, an advertisement, um, you know, uh, advertising cocaine tooth drops for, um, you know, relieving pain. So things were relatively stable for a couple of decades. Uh, and then in the, the 1920s, the Food, Drug, and Insecticide Administration was uh, reorganized and was put into the, the Bureau of Chemistry and Soils. And then a couple of years later, the, the FDIA was renamed the FDA. And a couple of years after being reorganized, uh, there was this outbreak of, of multiple deaths that were being traced back to an antibiotic elixir. And this all happened in September, October of 1937. And what this led to was a set of laws that were passed the following year in 1938. And it really it created something called the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. And this gave the FDA the ability to oversee the safety of food, drugs, and cosmetics, just like the act said. And really, again, this is all traced down to this, this elixir, uh, sulfinamide, which was linked with over 100 deaths. And the reason it was is because the antibiotic was actually mixed with diethylene glycol and then administered to people. And so you know, this caused a toxic reaction, and these people died. In 
So again, several decades of stability. And then in the 1960s, uh, the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare uh, commissioned a study on medical devices. And the reason for this was that at the time, there were medical devices that were unregulated on the market, making claims, and there was evidence of people getting hurt because of these medical devices. And really, the prototypical example of this is uh, the Dalcon Shield. And so the Dalcon Shield, which a lot of people learn about um, in history classes or in medical school, was an uh, intrauterine device designed to protect against having uh, unwanted pregnancy. And you can see in the device in the lower left-hand corner there is this, this plastic uh, trilobite-looking thing, but there's a string attached to it. And this, this particular string was actually traced back to causing septic shock in a lot of women. And the reason is because of that middle electron micrograph. And so that little string was actually a composite of many smaller strings kind of woven together. And then on the far right, what you can see is another electron micrograph of bacteria growing in between those, those individual components of that string. And so that's what led to the toxicity of this particular device. And so at the time, it's, it was estimated almost a million women were impacted by this, this particular flawed medical device. But in the regulatory landscape, this drove the desire to have medical devices regulated. And so during the early 1970s, there was lots of negotiation, and this finally came to pass as the medical device amendments of the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act. And so it was passed uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in May of 1976, and one of the really key elements of this is that it established this risk classification. So this risk classification from low risk, moderate risk, high risk, or some kind of alternative pathway. And then keyed up with this were if, depending on the risk level, there were different ways to go through the FDA with different levels of stringency. And this led to things being FDA registered or listed for low, class, low risk class devices. Moderate risk devices had to go through something called a 510K pathway, which became FDA cleared. And then high risk devices went through a pre-market approval or a PMA, and those are considered FDA approved. And so again, when you talk to people who do regulatory work, they're, when they say FDA cleared, that means a very, very different thing than FDA approved. And they will get upset with you if you use them incorrectly. So one of the consequences of this particular act was some verbiage that was included. And this is a word-for-word -word transcription of the verbiage. I've highlighted things that are important. So in this part 809, in vitro diagnostic products were specifically called out. And they're defined as those reagents, instruments, and systems intended for the use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions. And this is important because FDA didn't have the authority up until this point to regulate medical devices that were uh, in vitro reagents. And so all the FDA authority that uh, they've claimed up to this point started with this particular uh, paragraph. So we look back 45 years. And you know, FDA uh, looked at the landscape of laboratory tests. And they looked at things and said, well, there are there are laboratory tests that are manufactured in, by companies and they're distributed to laboratories. We want to regulate those. And then there's also this class of uh, in vitro diagnostics that are developed within laboratories or so-called laboratory developed tests. And at that point in time, they said, well, this is, this is a cottage industry. You know, the, the physicians and the scientists who are developing these tests, they're doing it in a small lab for their local patients. They have direct access to those patients we're going to exercise something called enforcement discretion. And so we're not going to, to enforce all the law that we possibly could at this time. So kind of in parallel to what was going on at the FDA, uh, there was something called the, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments, or CLIA. These were amendments to a law that was, uh, is called the Public Health Services Act. And this is, has a totally different history from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. I'm not going to get into it. But one of the key points of CLIA was that it, did, it was designed to regulate laboratories and regulate them in terms of quality standards and also provide a certification process. And one of the very specific parts of that law or statute is here. And so what it did was required that any test um, be verified and the performance specifications determined by the physicians who were using that test within the laboratory. Didn't matter if it was a kit that we bought or something that we made in the laboratory to offer to our patients, we had to do that. We had to determine the performance specifications. And I think anybody who's ever developed a test or verified a test will see the things that we look at. 
accuracy, precision, analytical sensitivity, analytical specificity, et cetera. But there's one little addition at the very bottom. Any other performance characteristic required for test performance. And so this is really what has allowed us the flexibility to evaluate all kinds of different technologies, all kinds of different platforms in a way that's appropriate to provide that testing to our patients. It's this particular statute that we apply every single day in the laboratory. So if we look at the, the roles of the FDA and the CMS or CLIA, FDA gets its authority from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act and the Medical Device Amendments. It's really designed to regulate the safety and effectiveness of devices and reagents. They really focus on the quality of manufacture and assay design, analytical validity, and clinical validity. So CLIA, again, that comes under the Public Health Services Act, totally separate law. It looks at the quality of clinical testing, the quality of the laboratory, Again, looking at the analytical validity, so the ability of a test to detect what we claim it's able to detect, and then clinical utility, whether or not this actually makes a difference to our patients. So you'll notice right off the bat, there are two things that both FDA and CMS regulate, and that is analytical validity. So this is setting up potential tension within the regulatory environment. So again, this, this all happened back in the 1970s, and, and through the 1980s, we had the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments, uh, 1988 version uh, that were enacted. And things were, again, stable for a couple of decades. And then, back in 2010, uh, there was a public meeting that the FDA had. And in that meeting, the FDA director announced that they intended to regulate all laboratory-developed tests. And they were going to move from enforcement discretion to what they called uh, exercising oversight. And so one of the things they mentioned at this particular meeting was that they were going to issue guidance documents rather than doing notice and comment rulemaking. And I'll explain what that is in just a moment. And so one of the things that, that Dr. Shuren mentioned, and this, this is a transcript from that particular meeting, is that the way the FDA views this is that they've always had the authority to regulate laboratory developed tests, regulate everything that, that we do for clinical care. But as an issue of policy, they were in, uh, having enforcement discretion, so deciding not to do it. And so in their mind, as soon as we decide to change the policy, then we can uh, regulate things as we see fit. So going back to what was said about you know, um, notice and comment rulemaking versus guidance. So in terms of regulating laboratory developed tests, there's basically three pathways to do it. So number one is something called a statute. So this is where Congress passes a law and as part of that law, they hand off the law to an agency and say, make up the regulations. And then once that agency makes up the regulations, that has the force of law. Second option is if something is already um, permissive under the law, they can do notice and comment rulemaking. And you can see that there's lots of different boxes in this particular pathway in the middle there. And so they have to put out a proposal. And it, that proposal has to receive comments. There has to be a public ana analysis. All the comments that were given actually have to be responded to, uh, and then they have to do a financial impact study, and then at the very bottom, there's a final rule. And again, because of the way that this process works, that rule is considered law at the end of the day. The third pathway is something called guidance. And so guidance is basically uh, just representing our current thinking in that particular agency. So they come out with a draft guidance, they receive comments, they don't have to respond to any of the co those comments, they don't have to change anything, but they can enact what's called the final guidance. And the important thing here is that this is quote unquote the current thinking of the agency and not law. So remember, that was how FDA said they were going to approach this regulation back in 2010. So 2010, things are quiet for four years. Then in October of 2014, the FDA released their guidance document. So this is a, a screenshot of that particular document. And you know, we can um, supply comments to this particular <clears throat> document via a docket. And so many of the people who are in uh, the Department of Laboratory Medicine, Department of Pathology, including many of our residents, actually wrote um, comments and submitted that to the docket for this. So if you look and see you know, which academic institution actually supplied the most comments, it was uh, University of Washington uh, in terms of raw number. You know, hundreds and hundreds of other comments were submitted, 
uh, both by industry as well as academia, and you can follow the link if you want to and, and read those comments to this day. So the way FDA was thinking about it at this point can be summed up in this diagram. This is actually a, a slide that I pilfered from the FDA. And so you can see here that they kind of looked at two separate regulatory pathways. One was for commercially distributed tests, one was for laboratory developed tests. So commercially distributed, you have a manufacturer that makes something in a factory and then seeks out FDA approval. Once FDA gives approval, they're able to market and sell those devices to end users, and then we can provide those results to the patients. In the terms of laboratory developed tests, the paradigm was we would design and validate a test within the laboratory. Because there was no FDA oversight, we could offer those to patients as laboratory developed tests. So the way they were looking at switching the paradigm was basically to make anyone who developed laboratory developed tests into a manufacturer. So we'd have to go through the same FDA approvals, we have to go through the same processes that manufacturers would have to go to. And then on top of that, we would also have to worry about regulations under CLIA to actually do the testing. And then uh, those of us who are licensed have to obtain licensure as well. So the big change is laboratory develop test developer is now a manufacturer under this scheme. So this kind of brings up this, this question of, you know, why is FDA doing this at this particular time and point? And so right around this, this particular time, I was at a, a neighborhood barbecue and uh, ran into somebody I hadn't met before. Turned out they were somebody that worked for Boeing. Uh, and they actually were <clears throat> not just a Boeing employee, but they were actually a representative of the FAA. And of course, you know, what you do after a couple of beers is you start talking about regulation. And so we were comparing and contrasting laboratory regulation versus the FAA. And he brought up this concept of regulations, FAA regulations are written in blood. And you know, as we started going through it, the reason for that is, is that there's something horrible that happens in an airline disaster or something like that that leads to a set of regulations that change the industry. And so this, this particular image is from a crash that happened in San Diego in 1979 that a lot of regulations spawned from, from that particular event. And I think a lot of us have been following the, the 737 MAX, and we know that there's gonna be new regulations that came out of those disasters as well. So is there anything comparable going on in the FDA and laboratory regulation? Well, if we look back, so we look back to the early 1900s, so you know, the whole impetus for the Pure Food and Drug Act was the conditions that, that uh, Upton uh, described in Chicago and all the, the consternation around that. And then in the 1930s, we had people that died from a solvent that was used inappropriately in a drug, right? New regulations came out of that. We had serious harm that came from medical devices in the 1960s and 70s that led to the medical device amendments. So what is the harm that's coming from laboratory developed tests? And this is really important because if you listen to the public testimony, especially of people in the FDA, they always talk about these, these tests can cause harm, they can, they can do all this damage to people, but they never actually give specifics. And it's the same thing with a lot of people who are very pro-regulation. They may be able to cite individual instances, but they can't see a, a systematic, or they can't describe a systematic process. So the FDA was obviously thinking along the same lines. So about a year after introducing that particular guidance document, uh, the night before a congressional hearing where it was just FDA officials in front of Congress, they released a document. They released it uh, late in the evening, so 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, 8 p.m. on the East Coast. Um, so there's no time you know, for comments or um, any kind of rebuttals, that type of thing. And the, the hearing was really interesting because they referred to this document multiple times uh, throughout it, but offered no uh, opposing viewpoints. And so in this document, they actually looked at 20 cases where they said, here, here are examples where laboratory developed tests have harmed patients. This is why we actually need to uh, regulate those. So those of us who read this particular document very quickly realized that most of the cases they described were either fictitious tests that didn't exist, they were tests that the FDA uh, would have had not been able to regulate in such a way that they could have changed the outcomes, or in some cases they were actually FDA cleared tests that caused harm to patients but were being passed off as laboratory developed tests. So a bunch of experts at the Association for Molecular, Molecular Pathology got together and actually rebutted those 20 examples that the FDA proposed. And so 18 of the 20, they basically said, you know, these, these are not good examples for these specific reasons, including that the test is made up, the test doesn't exist that the FDA is, is citing. And then the other two examples, the FDA actually wouldn't have had the authority to do anything about the, the bad outcome, to prevent the bad outcomes. 
So it, it's really unclear at this point whether or not you know, laboratory developed tests are causing harm that requires the vast amount of regulation that FDA is, is wanting to put on to uh, laboratories. So in 2014, 2015, several different groups got together and described alternative ways to uh, change the regulatory landscape um, with different ideas. And so here's three of them. So the College of American Pathologists actually offered a proposal back in 2009 uh, that hasn't really changed all that much. A group called the Diagnostic Test Working Group uh, offered a proposal, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, as well as the Association for Molecular Pathology. So the DTWG is actually really interesting. So this is actually an uh, initiative of a, a law firm or a firm that's called Levitt Partners. And so anyone who uh, has lived in Utah in the last 30 years knows Mike Levitt. He was the, the governor when I was in uh, high school and college. And uh, he became HHS secretary underneath uh, President George Bush. After he left office, he formed a private firm to offer advice on health matters. And so uh, back in 2015, a group of uh, laboratories, so reference laboratories and manufacturers, it's often been cited four manufacturers and four reference labs, although I can't always find who those four manufacturers are, got together and came up with a compromise proposal. And this particular compromise proposal was interesting in the fact that they wanted everything to be equal. They wanted a, un uh, a unique universal landscape for all laboratory developed tests and manufactured tests. And they wanted all test development to be overseen by the FDA. So design, development, validation, and manufacture. They wanted a hard line between FDA and CMS, which would administer the laboratory testing process under CLIA. And then the states would regulate uh, medicine through uh, licensure. So it's a very interesting proposal. They uh, shopped it around quite a bit. But one of the interesting things that they did is they actually took that proposal and they turned it into draft legislative language. And they talked with legislators in different parts of the country and had them act as sponsors. And the idea was to add, have this in legislative language. This is the starting point of the discussion. Once something is in, in that language, that becomes the starting point for all other discussions, all modifications. And so as part of that, they requested something called technical assistance. And so technical assistance is where a congressperson can ask a federal agency like the FDA or CMS or the EPA, here's the law that we're thinking about passing, tell us what you think about that. And if you talk to people who do this very often, what they say and what they expect is basically that the agency will go through and say, I like line one, this is good, oh, you forgot about this, don't like line two, I'm going to cross it out with a red line. And so that's what these people were expecting. And so that happened back in March of 2017. And for months and months and months, over a year, they waited for technical assistance from the FDA. When they finally got it, it came back as this really unusual document. So remember what I said is that normally what people expect is, is a red line edit. So here's the law, here's what I like, here's what I don't like. Instead, they got back this, this multi-page document describing the FDA's philosophy on laboratory regulation and what they thought was important and, and how it interfaced with uh, the, the DAIA Act. And you know, there's a disclaimer that says there's no, this is no endorsement, et cetera. But what was really interesting is beside that text document, they actually provided the technical assistance. Here's our technical assistance, and we just handily wrote it in the form of a totally new law that is different from what you submitted to us 18 months ago. So the, the technical assistance that came back was so unusual that this really caught the eye of a lot of people in the, the legal community. So this is a, a blog post from a, a group that does a lot of work with the FDA law. And so uh, Jeff Gibbs is a uh, really prominent lawyer in this space. And so his you know, title here, I think, says it all. It's not just technical assistance. This is not what we were expecting. This is very unusual. And the, it's really important because all of a sudden, you know, the FDA had basically written its own law for how it wants to regulate laboratory developed tests and all tests for that matter. And by doing that and giving it back to the sponsors, they upended the whole discussion right there. So whereas the DAIA Act was the, the central point, that was what we were gonna start with, now all of a sudden we're starting with this new act that the FDA wrote themselves. <laughs> 
So, and some of the things in this, this particular uh, draft law are really interesting. And so one of the concepts that FDA had been working on and, and probably took so long on was this concept of pre-certification. And so FDA realized that there's so many tests that are out there, this is so necessary to, to medical care in the United States, they need to have a way to you know, effectively um, regulate this space. And so they came up with this idea of basically certifying laboratories and saying you can do testing in this particular area, we trust you, you can develop uh, further tests without going through the FDA. Their initial uh, idea here was something called uh, test groups. And this is an idea of combination of technology and application. And so there's a bunch of common elements here. So you know, what is the substance that you're measuring? What's the specimen? What's the test method? What's the purpose? So a purpose is, you know, I'm testing a genetic, I'm using a genetic test to tell somebody whether or not they're at risk for cancer, or I'm using a genetic test on somebody's cancer to tell them about treatment. So, you know, you're still using the same genetic test, you're just using it for different purposes. You know, what the disease is, the patient population, and then where even it's gonna be used. And so what this, when all this was played out, you would wind up in the situation where basically things that were identical in terms of laboratory process but had a slightly different application would require separate submissions to the FDA. And the way the FDA had envisioned this was this would be the, the Cadillac submission process, their most rigorous, their most expensive, uh, and you would have to do this on a repeated basis for every single test um, group that you wanted to use. The other caveat was they, Remember in 1976, they came up with this idea of low risk, moderate risk, high risk. And so a lot of testing fell into this moderate risk category, very little in the high risk, and then a fair amount in the low risk category. And the FDA blew that whole system up with this proposal and said there's only gonna be two categories. There's gonna be high risk tests and low risk tests. And anything that's high risk can't go through this pre-certification. And so you know, what is a high risk test? Just to give you an idea of what the complexity of this particular law looked like, this is a, uh, a flow diagram from um, some experts in the field. And don't worry about reading it. I just want you to appreciate that this is how complex this particular version of the law was just to decide whether or not something was eligible for pre-certification or not. And I will say this is the simplified version of this particular flow. So, What's been going on since 2018? So there have been numerous meetings with the FDA industry. So ACLA, Avamed are, are two of the industry groups that are, are very prominent in this space. Uh, DTWG, again, so this is financed by you know, large laboratories and manufacturers. Uh, legislative staff, uh, College of American Mythologists has been involved. And this has led to revisions of, of the valid text. But when you look at who's been invited to these meetings, the academics aren't, haven't been included. And this is uh, very interesting because they've had access to academics to, to discuss our particular needs and the way things work out. So uh, I actually was in uh, Baltimore last November uh, for a scientific meeting. And we found out that one of these meetings was going on and the Association for Molecular Pathology pulled some strings and we got to go into one of these meetings. And it was really interesting because on one side of the table is FDA, on the other side are the people writing the law. And the people who are writing the law would say, what do you think about um, how much extra work is it gonna be to do a quality system uh, regulation? And the FDA would say, it's no additional scientific work to do that. And the law maker would say, okay, that's great, and they move on. And I'd have to say, well, wait a second, it isn't any additional work, but I have to do all this documentation, I have to do all these other things that I don't have to do now that don't really add anything to my patients. And so for multiple hours, we had this back and forth discussion where you know, a viewpoint that had never been given before, we were able to offer to the legislative staff. So it was a great opportunity for us, but at the same time, it was very frustrating that they hadn't been able to access that uh, prior to our being there. So all that work led to what's been called the Verifying Accurate Leading Edge IVCT Development Act of 2020, or the Valid Act for short. So this is the distillation of the DAIA Act, the first version of Valid, and then this is with all the new comments. So this is introduced into both the Senate and the House on March 5th of this year, right in the middle of the, or by the beginning of the, the COVID pan pandemic. They have both Republicans and Democrats on the bill. 
So if you look at who the sponsors are, so we have uh, Larry Bouchon, who's from Indiana. So Roche Diagnostics has a huge outpost in Indianapolis. Uh, Diana DeGett from Colorado. Richard Burr from North Carolina, where LabCorp is based. And then Michael Bennett from Colorado. So I'm not sure what the, the Colorado connection is with this particular law, but they're on the bill. And so what does this bill do? So it amends the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to include drugs, devices, and in vitro clinical tests. So this is basically codifying in the statute that clinical testing is something the FDA can regulate. And this is a little bit different from the reagent uh, verbiage that was used back in 1976. So there's a huge number of provisions in this particular act. The, the act is over, uh, I think it's 245 pages in length. I'm just gonna cover a couple of the, the really important high points. So the authority. So one of the things about the FDA is they can only regulate things that are actually introduced into interstate commerce. They, they aren't allowed to do things that are within a state. And so as one part of the law fairly early on, it actually says that if you do any kind of laboratory testing, if you develop a test, you're considered to be engaging in interstate commerce, regardless of, of whether or not you're offering that test to people outside your state. And so this is, this is where the authority F, FDA is getting to actually do a lot of this regulation. So they've said we're gonna regulate in vitro clinical tests and we've given ourselves the authority to do so. What's the scope of this? So not just reagents, not just manufacturing, but test protocols. So this is what we use in laboratory developed tests. We create a protocol that we use every single day to reproduce the results um, and then um, provide that to patients. They, they do put a caveat in that say that all these laws that we, we're introducing here, they aren't gonna be duplicative of CLIA. Uh, they don't say how, they don't say you know, who's gonna divvy up responsibility, just that we say they're not gonna be duplicative, so they're, therefore they're not. They can still regulate instrumentation, they can still regulate uh, devices for collecting, and also they can regulate software. So this is something that uh, FDA has been working on for many years as well. And then uh, this will all go into effect four years after this law is passed. So again, looking at the scope, analytical validity, so whether or not a test can detect the, the analyte that they're interested in. Clinical validity, so how that relates to disease. So does this particular uh, analyte uh, predict that you have cancer, for example? Doesn't touch on clinical utility, that's whether or not this particular test is useful to the patient, but uh, clinical validity, analytical validity are two of the things that they're really concerned about. And in terms of test development, they, they classify this broadly. So developing tests, importing tests, and modifying tests. So a lot of the tests that we use in the laboratory today, we do modifications on to make them a better test or to fit better within our laboratory after we make sure that it, the, the test works as well as we expect. So all that would be under FDA's purview, whereas currently it is not. So remember I said uh, risk classification is a big thing. So, so high risk versus low risk. So high risk tests have the potential for unreasonable risk of serious or irreversible harm or death. And so what, what does potential mean? It means, is it possible? You know, one in a million chance, one in 10 million chance. So the, you know, one of the, the ways to think about how the FDA regulates things is safety at any price, right? So there's no, if it, it decreases the odds of something bad happening, even from one person, we absolutely have to do it. Also, you know, whether or not, uh, care is gonna be delayed or discontinued based on the test result. They do throw out some things about mitigating measures, and these are whether or not there's confirmatory tests, whether or not the, the technology is well understood, but you know, the, the risk to the patient is, is the highest priority. When we look at low risk tests, it's exactly what you would think. So minimal or no harm if there's an incorrect result. There's other tests that can be used. Uh, there's mitigating measures, et cetera. So those are the, the two classifications that FDA has established now. A lot of the feedback they got with the uh, 2014 uh, guidance was that you know, there's gonna be diagnostic shortages because a lot of tests that we use to take care of our patients are not gonna be able to be offered anymore. And so FDA recognized this and they said, well, any test that's on the market the day that valid is introduced or actually approved, those tests can be grandfathered. So as long as you don't change those tests, you can continue offering those to patients. Uh, you do have to do a couple of things, like you have to agree to you know, report things uh, to the FDA if something goes wrong. 
or uh, doing registration and listing, which is basically just telling the FDA that you're doing it and, and paying a fee. But the key is, is that you know, any grandfather test cannot be modified, so you can't improve it, right? It's one of the reasons we design laboratory developed tests is because there, there's iterative improvements. Medicine is changing all the time. Science is changing all the time. That would not be permitted for a grandfathered test. Any test that you would want to take uh, through the process would have to go through something called a pre-market review if it was a high-risk test. And you'd have to look at all kinds of different things. So, you know, what are the alternatives? You have to do different studies. You have to do risk assessments. And then, you know, this evidence of clinical and uh, analytical validity. So, you know, how, how intrusive, how expensive is this process? So this particular chart uh, was from a study commissioned by Avamed back in 2010. And it's looking at all medical devices, not just laboratory tests, but looking at the two main pathways. So 510K was kind of the, the moderate risk category, and a PMA is the high risk category. So anything that's in a high risk category, which is a lot of things that we would do in the academic medical center setting, would fall under this PMA bucket. So you can see in this particular survey, so again, they call this an estimate, you know, the total cost in 2010 was about $100 million to take one thing to market. And the vast majority of that, so about 75% of that cost, is what they consider regulatory costs. So just the cost of interacting with the FDA and, and doing all the documentation and things that they asked for. So you know, this is, is probably an overestimation for a lot of laboratory tests, but you can see that you know, we're, we're talking millions of dollars per test. If you look at a typical laboratory, you know, we do thousands upon thousands of tests, you know, and a, a fair proportion of those can be laboratory developed. So this can be very expensive very quickly. So what are things that we didn't, don't have to take through pre-market under this scheme? Low risk tasks, so anything that fits in that category. There were also some really interesting things that, that FDA put into the law um, to uh, target very specific constituencies. So manual tests was one example. And so the example there is immunohistochemistry that's commonly used in pathology, you know, to look at different protein expression and different tissues. But what's really interesting is they actually did a carve out as well and said if anything that is used to help predict disease or predict treatment, something like that, that's high risk. So that's PDL1 testing that we do every single day for uh, immunotherapy response, mismatch repair IHC that we use to predict whether or not um, somebody could be at risk for Lynch syndrome. Those fall into a higher risk category and have to go through uh, the higher risk process. They did carve out a humanitarian use. Uh, so if you do less than 10,000 tests across the entire country per year, you don't have to submit to the FDA. Uh, they, again, they carve out, they say it can't be a fatal condition and it can't be infectious disease. So two things that you may want to use in humanitarian uh, nature. Uh, they also carved out something called rarely used. So if you do less than five tests per year, you wouldn't have to submit it. Uh, something that they called a custom test for a single patient, so something that you use just for diagnosis on one specific person. Public health surveillance, uh, law enforcement, uh, general lab equipment, etc. Uh, they do say you don't have to submit an investigational test, but you still have to go through their IDE process, which uh, has its own uh, pain points. So, you know, they came up with this idea of pre-certification in their initial draft, and then it came back in a different form in the Valid Act of 2020. And now it's called something, uh, they decided to call it technology certification. And so this is for very specific types of tests. So things that aren't eligible, first of a kind, uh, things that you use at home, things that are direct to consumer, things that are companion diagnostic, so whether or not you can use a drug with the, the result based on this test. And very specifically, high-risk tests aren't to be included in this pre-certification scheme. So how does this particular version work? And so in this version of pre-certification, what is required is submitting a procedure for how you're going to do the validation, verification, acceptance criteria. It's not exactly what you're going to do, but how you're going to go about that process. They also want to know that you're able to do this, so you have evidence that you've done this well before and that you're, you're competent in this area. And then you have to submit a full pre-market approval for one of your tests, and it has to be the most complicated uh, in terms of analytical complexity that you have. And so then if everything goes well and they say, okay, this, this is a good test, you can develop within a technology category, which I'll get to in just a second, for a duration of somewhere between two and four years. And within that time, you don't have to submit any, uh, anything for modifications. 
any new tests in that category, don't have to submit anything, still have to keep documentation, but you don't have to go through the whole process. And then at the end of that period of time, you have to submit another test, go through the whole process again to get that, that pre-certification. So the, this idea of instrument family is a little bit new. And again, I think this came from the discussions that they had uh, with stakeholders during this intervening uh, couple of years, where people said, you know, it's, it, it's not tenable to have the same test that's used for different applications that goes to the FDA twice. It just doesn't make sense. So instead, what they came up with is this idea where if you have a technology that has the same basic architecture, same basic uses and functions, same basic principles, and same type of results, we can treat those all the same. And they've come up with, a, I think it's 16 different categories at this point. So here are their, their specific things that they call out in the law. They do note they can have um, anything else if it becomes available. There's two I'd like to point out. Uh, so the one that I, would, I use every day is the next generation sequencing. So in this particular case, any next generation sequencer assay that we took through the FDA would grant us use to every next generation sequencing application that's available in the clinical laboratory. So we could take through a cancer diagnostic test if that fit into the, the uh, risk classification. And then we would be allowed to do testing on different instruments. So we could use an Illumina platform, we could use a PacBio platform, we could use an ion uh, torrent platform. We could test for microbial uh, applications. FDA would never look at that data. We would just assume that we're doing a good job because we did a good job with something else. The same thing with mass spec. And so I think uh, Dr. Hufnagel would probably tell you that all the different flavors of mass spectrometry have different uh, considerations. So inductively coupled plasma mass spec is a different application, a different use than LCMS MS. But under the FDA's current vision of things, if you were able to prove that you could do it, either one of those platforms well with one particular application, you could use any, any particular uh, flavor of that for any application for multiple years. The other part about this uh, particular uh, draft legislation, actually it is legislation now, is that uh, they realized again, they don't have the, the resources to do all these reviews. And so they'd have to hire or allow third parties to do the reviews for them. So they specifically carve out assay submissions, uh, technology assessments, and on-site inspections. And the interesting thing about how this is structured is the third party would review the documents and basically make a recommendation to FDA, and FDA could agree with that recommendation or disagree, and then whatever the decision was would be final. So this is a, a suggestion at this point. What's really interesting is that they actually state out in the law, you know, who can become a third party reviewer. So no government employees, uh, nobody who develops a laboratory developed test. So the people who you would want to be looking at your data to decide whether or not you're doing a good job would specifically be banned under the law. If you talk to people at FDA, they'll say, well, really what we meant is that not a developer in that particular application. So if I'm developing a next generation sequencing test, I could have somebody who's a flow cytometry expert review it, but not somebody who's doing an NGS test uh, in another place. That isn't in the law though. So if it's not in the law, it, it becomes the uh, purview of regulations. Um, then there's a couple other things like no financial conflicts. They don't have to register, which means they haven't done things that are illegal in the past. So this, there's the multiple pathways to approval. So pre-market approval is a high-risk task. Pre-certification, it's unclear how this is going to work because high-risk tests can't go through it. Low-risk tests don't have to go through it. So, and there is no moderate risk test uh, a category in this particular statute. And so how this is all gonna work, we have no idea. You know, there's this possibility that, that maybe a high risk test with some mitigating measures may allow you to go through it, but again, it's not, not spelled out. Uh, emergency use, so this is really important given the, the COVID pa pandemic. And the take home message is that basically the, the way the emergency use statute uh, is written in this document is it's essentially what we have now underneath the uh, less regulated EUA process. So basically you have to tell FDA that you're gonna uh, use a test and then send them data at a later date. Uh, the quality systems regulations, uh, there's a couple that are actually put in here. 
Uh, one is design controls. So this is an idea where basically there's a very uh, stepwise process that has to be gone through when you're designing a test and you have to do an iterative improvement. And so if you get to the end, your device doesn't meet your specifications that you sent out at the beginning, you have to repeat the whole process, you have to document everything. It's more complicated than that, but it, uh, it's a much more documentation heavy process than what we go through right now. The other thing that, that sounds relatively benign is this corrective and preventative action. And so this is the idea that you know, there's a problem, you identify a root cause, you research the solution, you verify the solution works, and then you implement it. These are things that we do every single day in the laboratory. You know, we, we identify things, we, we make changes, and we implement those changes. The problem comes with the documentation. And so there's, there's actually a whole industry that's evolved around this uh, CAPA documentation. And so this is just a, an example of some of the things that have to be documented. And so another thing to remember about the FDA is that if you haven't documented it, you haven't done it. And so uh, most um, manufacturers that do this particular process, they do it using expensive custom software. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are a bunch of things I left out. Uh, things that I want people to realize are in there is promotional speech. So you wouldn't be able to talk about things because you are a uh, manufacturer and you, you couldn't talk um, to other professionals about your tests. There's lots of fees. Nobody knows what the fees would be. Um, adverse event reporting. Let's see what else. Oh, and then practice of medicine. So if you're interested, 245 pages. It's available online. There are links uh, throughout my presentation. So I think at this point, you can probably appreciate that you know, to get where we're at today, there's been this really convoluted path that's, that's been followed for nearly a decade to get to where we're at. The, you know, the, the legislation has been introduced. There really aren't any alternative proposals as of March 5th. And you know, this is, again, envisioned as a starting point for discussion. So everything's going to be modified off of this law. So some problems and questions. So you know, if, if oversight of tests is really that important, you know, within pre-certification, there's a possibility tests will be introduced and offered to patients without any review for multiple years. You have non-expert inspectors who are able to say whether or not something is good or bad who don't necessarily have the content knowledge. And then there's this whole idea of QSRs, which is a whole new level of regulatory documentation um, that's gonna be very, very expensive and not necessarily offer much in terms of what we already have. So again, I said as of March 5th, there was no alternative. So on March 17th, a couple weeks after the initial uh, valid introduction, uh, Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky introduced a separate bill. And he called it the Verified Innovative Testing in American Laboratories Act of 2020, or VITAL. So I'm not gonna really talk about VITAL very much because there's not a whole lot to talk about. Uh, so if you look at valid, 245 pages, new regulatory paradigm, pre-certification, grandfathering, emergency use, all kinds of exceptions, all kinds of very specific legislation. If you look at VITAL, seven pages, four pages of that is just explaining what laboratory developed tests are, how we use it in medicine, why it's important. Three pages of the actual statute, and that comes down to three things. Laboratory developed tests are professional service. This is something that, that as doctors, we do for patients. Laboratory developed tests should be regulated under CLIA. FDA shouldn't have a role in regulating laboratory developed tests or modifications of tests. The Clinical Laboratory Improvements Amendments, they've been around since 1988. They haven't been updated. There are many parts of that law that need to be updated. And in fact, CLIA is constantly being modernized in bits and pieces. The VITAL Act actually gives uh, permission to do this in a much more systematic way to really bring this law up to the 21st century. And the final part, because of all that was happening in uh, COVID diagnostics at the time, a third part of the legislation was basically to mandate a uh, series of hearings around what happened, what went wrong, how can we do it better next time. Okay, so where is it going? So right now, uh, I think as anyone who reads any kind of popular press, watches any kind of news, there's a lot of interest around laboratory testing uh, because of COVID-19. Um, you can imagine that the sponsor of this particular legislation are really interested in getting this legislation through the process this year. There's a lot of problems. 
uh, there's a lot of different congressional priorities. You know, what what is Congress going to do in terms of you know keeping the economy running, protecting patients, you know, providing medical care, etc. It's an election year. Uh, generally, big things don't happen in election years. Um, we don't know how vital is going to impact things. You know, I will mention that Rand Paul is on one of the key committees in the Senate, and that's going to to slow down uh, the progress of valid in this. The other thing that's coming up is something called the medical device user fee amendments. So these are the fees that medical user, medical device pays the FDA. This is a, a bill that comes up every five years. It's coming up again uh, in the next couple of years, but all the hearings that they were slated for uh, yesterday actually have been canceled uh, because of COVID. So this is, this is a huge deal to the FDA. This is a reason they want to get something into legislation as soon as possible. So in summary, you can see that the history of medical regulation is complex. I have, haven't even touched on the Public Health Services Act, a whole different story there as well. Um, there's many different regulations that are out there that impact our ability to care for patients. There's many different proposals that are going through the process and two that are in uh, legislative language in Congress right now. They can really impact how we are able to care for patients going forward. And then, you know, I think the take home is that all the things that have been happening this year in terms of laboratory testing have really uh, demonstrated to the public that there are issues in this, this area. And so I think you know, the idea that we won't have regulation uh, is not tenable. So lots of people to thank. So uh, both current and past leadership of the Department of Laboratory Medicine. I really want to call out University of Washington Government Affairs colleagues. So Sarah Castro is uh, DC based and is wonderful to work with. Uh, Ian Goodhue just recently left for Google, but uh, worked with him for very uh, for many many years. Uh, also, many people I think in the uh, AMP and CAP, and then also uh, one of my longtime mentors, uh, Dr. Ashwood. So, the thing to remember is we can influence the process. So, Patty Murray is the ranking Democrat on the Health Committee, uh, very influential in Washington. Here are several of her staff emails. You know we should be able to contact them and tell them our perspective. And then uh, Senator Cantwell also is a very important person in the Senate on the uh, Finance Committee and the Health Care Subcommittee. So with that, I'll uh, take any questions that people have. Eric, very nice talk. While we're waiting for questions online, I okay. to get the prerogative asking another question. So uh, you, you say that you know, some legislation is, is happening uh, is, is going to happen in this realm at some point in time. Um, how much of that um, is going to be like modifications of the valid act in your opinion? And how much of that's, how, how much of a likelihood is there that they just scrap the valid act entirely and start from scratch? That's, that's a good question. So I would have said uh, March 5th, I said it's probably unlikely. I would have said that's the, the vehicle that's going to be used for this. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, discussion, different opinions, things like that, but a lot of um, heavy players are aligned behind it. Um, with the VITAL Act now also introduced and also all the issues we've been seeing around COVID testing, I, I think it's less certain. Um, and really, you have to remember that, you know, um, the congressional cycle is a multi-year cycle. So they introduced the law now. If it isn't passed at the end of this Congress, all the progress they made is over. They have to reintroduce it. They have to go through the same process again. So um, at this point, I, I don't think anything's gonna happen. I think there's just too much, uh, too many different opinions. There, there's just too much going on. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think a lot of the, the problems have been revealed. And so you're gonna see a lot of uh, public pressure for things to be reformed. Thank you. So Debbie Nickerson says, Eric, great talk. If there isn't a user fee for the FDA that's, that's renewed, will they be able to maintain their oversight? So uh, the, the MADUFA Act and all, all the different DUFAs uh, that FDA goes through, it, it's usually to reset their uh, fee schedules. And so one of the reasons they want to get this particular law passed is so they can set the fee schedule for how they're going to charge us to put things through the FDA. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, a PMA, just to submit a PMA uh, to the FDA right now, it's about a quarter million dollars. Uh, that's just the, the cash you have to give them to consider your application. So that would be, 
somewhere in the range per test, what we would expect. Thank you. So I think Karen Suchia says, would the, would the College of American Pathologists have any role in the valid regulatory framework? So it, it's interesting. So um, up until this year, uh, CAP has been very um, insistent that their proposal is the one that should be used. And they actually released a press release of when the Valid Act was introduced that this is the right way to move forward. And this is, uh, you know, we support this as the, the starting point. So something has changed at CAP and they've, uh, they're taking a little bit different approach now. So they're, they're actually in support of this. The Valid Act, not the Vital Act. And so, so would they be a third, to presumably be a third party uh, uh, regulator or th third party? Yeah, reviewer? so the, <clears throat> the third party reviewer uh, is definitely a potential um, business opportunity for the College of American Mythologists. Other questions? Well, I don't see any other questions online and we're coming to the end of time. So thank you very much, Dr. Connick. I hope that everyone shares their applause online and thanks you for their talk later on. Thank you.